Actually, I should say that I don't like this thing because it implies instantly enormous amount of political correctness, no jokes, no anything. Okay. So, and before I get too much excited, the work is done together with uh, several co uh, collaborators. So we, we are working with Vincent Delacroix, Elise Goujard, and Peter, Z and Peter Zograf for already a while. And since recently, Amola Garwal, uh, a PhD student from Harvard, joined us. And I use this occasion to make uh, publicity for him. I realized that he is giving mini course this summer at uh, at Skolter, at summer school. The guy is, he, he made his studies at MIT with Alyosha Baradin, and now he is in Harvard. And the guy is absolutely exceptional. This is incredible person. I strongly recommend this young guy. Okay, so let me start with the results and take part of these things as sort of intuitive objects, and I will formalize them later. The thing which I'm interested in is the following. So when we draw uh, curves on a surface, I'm, in this talk I'm interested only in, the, in curves which do not have self-intersections and which are closed and which can, ha can have multiple components. So we draw curves usually on a surface naively as some very short thing which goes around the handle. If you take sort of a typical curve, it has this shape. And looking at this picture, you cannot recognize neither. So assume that I tell you that this collection of curves are non-intersecting, non-self-intersecting. They are all closed. But it is not instant to visualize and to realize how many components has this curve, how many com curves between these components are freely homotopic equivalent to each other, and what is the underlying so-called multi-curve. And I'm interested in the following thing. First, what is the statistics of these multi-curves? What is a typical multi-curve? What is a typical random multi-curve? And I'm particularly interested in this question when the genus of the surface is large. When genus is small, for example, for genus 2, there complete information about statistics of curves, multi-curves, simple closed geodesics was obtained in the papers of Maria Mirzahani. I'm interested in high genus asymptotics. And actually, this is what she was doing in the last years of her life, but just did not have time to, to finish it. So in particular, I'm interested in the following question. Suppose that we chop our surface along all these black curves. It decomposes into stripes. And the question is how many connected component, components would we get typically? Separately, genus 2, 3. Separately, high genus asymptotics. And I repeat, I'm particularly interested in high genus asymptotics. So this is sort of a really new part in this story. Now. This is the way to encode a multi-curve, meaning that among this, suppose that you have many connected components along, among these curves. So y when you have several curves which are freely homotopic to each other, I just can record them as one and the same curve taken with multiplicity, which is the number of freely homotopic components. So in this Writing, I suppose that curves gamma 1, gamma 2, etc., gamma k are pairwise not freely homotopic. And when there are components which are freely homotopic to one of them, I memorize it just by, by weight. This object is called multi curve. And there is a way to formalize the notion of a random multi curve. And to consider random multi-curves. And then the next question is, what is the probability that a random multi-curve has 1, 2, 3, up to 3g minus 3, which is the maximal possible number of different freely homotopic components? Uh, what can be told about typical weights? And what 
is the shape of a random multi-curve of large genes. We'll see very soon that all these questions, I'm <coughs> stating them formally for multi-curves, they have interpretation in terms of simple closed hyperbolic geodesics for any hyperbolic metric. You can transform all these curves into simple closed hyperbolic <coughs> geodesics and you can repeat all these questions for <coughs> geodesics. And there is one more object which would appear, which is square tile surfaces. So that's, that's my point of interest. And I, one more time, I repeat that I'm interested in high genus asymptotics. I'm trying to understand what is their sort of the geometry of a random hyperbolic surface of large genus. And this is one of the approaches. Uh, I will say more about multicurves later, but let me just pronounce one word. Uh, we sort of used to work with closed cycles as with elements of the first homology. Homology is definitely a wonderful notion. We just have linear space and integer points in this linear space, but it loses part of information. And one can work with multi-curves with free homotopy types of curves, of closed curves, formalizing them as through the notion of space of measured laminations and through the notion of integer points in this space of measured laminations. And basically, the only thing which I have to mention without giving any formalization is that this space of measured laminations has piecewise linear structure and multi-curves are integer points in this uh, sort of complicated polyhedron. Yeah, that's what I'm doing. Uh, why you Multicurve, because you can have, uh, you can have, say, suppose that I make a complicated diffeomorphism of the surface, trying to simplify this picture. And at the end, you can get a curve which, say, goes around this handle, and another component which goes here and separates the surface into two components. So we, you have two components. They are not homotopic to each other. And they're really a seriously topological different. One is separating curve, another non-separating curve. So when you look at this picture, you cannot be sure that if there are several connected components, all of them are freely homot homotopic one to another. Uh, there, uh, there, is, there is piecewise linear structure, but no additive structure, no group structure. I'm sort of consciously passing from homology to, to this more complicated space, which, which has some advantages. What does it mean? Is it a triangulated surface? What does it mean? Uh, piecewise linear structure means that you have sort of a polyhedron uh, with integer points. That's probably the best, the best way to answer. And I apologize, I don't want to go into details because then it would take me two lectures to speak about train tracks, coordinates, and so on. This is, I don't know, Thurston took several years to, to, to invent and formalize this. It's beautiful structure and unfortunately not well known. Okay. very soon. <laughs> so wait just a second. So I can also consider sort of conditional probabilities. I can consider only curves of some particular type. For example, simple cur closed curve on surfaces of genus 2. And I can ask, so and all, probably one more word. When I'm saying, saying random simple closed curve or random something, it's like speaking about random integer numbers. What what does it mean, random integer numbers? How do you formalize this notion? Well, it's quite, it, it became sort of a general point. You consider all integer numbers in the interval, for example, from 1 to 1 million. And you consider statistical problems, the uh, properties of these integer numbers. For example, you can decompose them into prime factors. And you can discuss how often do you see prime factor decomposition of length one, two, and so on, or all kind of 
equations about prime factor decomposition. For uniform distribution, yeah. zero Yeah. Yeah. I'm working exactly in the same setting. I have, I'm using this, so I consider all simple closed curves or multi-curves of sort of length or combinatorial complexity bounded by some large number, and I consider uniform distribution. Oh, sorry, I didn't, so that, that's, oh, I thought that you're asking what is the answer for, for the distribution between, like, the, oh, yeah, uniform. The most naive, discrete uniform. Yes, absolutely. So you can consider the restricted version of this problem. For example, you can consider simple closed curves on the surface of genus 2. And topologically, there are only two types. Either your simple closed curve is non-separating like here or separating like here. And any simple closed curve can be sent to one of these two by diffeomorphism. So now you consider all these simple closed curves, which are now are allowed to be long. And for example, you bound the length in some fixed hyperbolic metric. And uh, Maria Mirzahani computed the frequencies of them in her paper. And somehow, he, cons he computed many frequencies, and most of them are computed correctly. However, for this particular one, which is present in more or less every talk about her results, Everybody uses this 1 over 6. Well, up to recently used 1 over 6. If you read attentively the paper, then you see that she puts 2 to numerate instead of denominator at some point, so then you get 1 over 24. And then if you correct one much trickier bug related to the fact that surfaces of genus 2 are all, always hyperelliptic and there's this nasty hyperelliptic convolution which transforms your moduli space into orbifold and with this extra symmetry and so on. So you get 1 over 48. And I, you see, I'm very accurate with claiming that there is something wrong. It was checked and rechecked by many different ways. So one can, so this is the original computation of Mariam, which is, which is basically correct. It's a, it's, a it's a theorem. It's one of her, it's one of her, it's part of her Fields medal, this theorem computation of frequencies of simple closed zero disks. And, part, and basically, actually, it was obtained already in her thesis. So this is one. Uh, I don't know many cases when PhD thesis was published in three papers, one in Annals of Mathematics, one in Invencionus, and one in Journal of American Mathematical Society. So it was a very impressive thesis. I'm saying that if you take a simple closed curve, you know that you have only one. So I take a picture like here. But now I tell you in advance that this is a connected curve. There is only one connected component. My, my, my question is simple. You say number. In your formula, you say number. Yeah. What does it mean? What do you mean by number? What, which two curves do you mean? That's what I'm trying to say. You compute the frequency of among long curves like this, you count how often do you see separating curves and how often non-separating. And the ratio, you see, you see, uh, sorry, you see. You ah, what do? Yeah. 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 Yes. Yes, sorry, sorry, I, I'm always thinking about so, yeah, something next, I apologize. No, no, no. Please slow me down and, and insist, do it. Okay, so this is just illustration that in any particular genus, you can find this pre frequency explicitly and the answer is given by a rational number, which is computable. Now. I told that I'm interested by high genus. In genus which is high, the separating curves are basically already non-existent. So the probability to find, to take a simple closed curve by random and to get a separating one is extremely small. You see it, gr it decreases very rapidly in genus. Yes.
this would appear in a second. So I fix the metric, but one of the theorems of Mirzahani is that though you count these frequencies using a fixed metric, she proves that it does not depend on the metric at the end of the day. So it's purely topological. It's, it's extremely strange. I absolutely agree. It, it is well. You you have you are you are you are right. You have to establish some bound for complexity of the curve in some means, and it is a th well. You can you like when we say a random integer number, we consider integer numbers on an interval from one to n to some yeah. bound. Now you have to tell what do you mean by bound for the length. Ah, you mean how, how you yes. compute the length? Yes. Uh, so one of the ways to compute the length is impose some fixed, your favorite hyperbolic metric on this topological surface. And this instantly gives you the length. We'll come to this shortly. And part of the results of Mirzahani is that actually the answer is topological and not geometric, that the answer does not depend on the length, which is not so obvious at the from the beginning. But you are right that there are other ways to establish the bound for the length. You can do it combinatorially, geometrically, by some, say, you compute the number of intersections with some sample curve or whatever. There are plenty of ways. And, and there are plenty of theorems saying that basically all reasonable ways are equivalent and give the very same frequencies because these frequencies are, have topological meaning and not geometric. Okay, so how Mirzahani and how do we get the answers and the asymptotics? These frequencies are related to uh, whatever your terminology you prefer, the integrals of psi classes over MGN, correlators, intersection numbers, uh, and the fact that one can do something for simple closed curves is due to the fact that for separating curves, the correlators which we need are just those for which there is explicit formula. And for non-separating curves, everything is expressed in terms of these correlators of two psi classes. And we get explicit and uniform asymptotics for these numbers. And now I can, yeah, now I can uh, state their main conditional theorem telling what structure has a random multicurve in light genes. So claim number one. We start with a, with a random multicurve which is which uh, which is allowed to have this uh, multipl well this multiplicities. A separate statement concerns the so-called reduced multicurve when I forget these multiplicities and replace all of them by one. I just consider on the topology of underlying collection of curves. Now they are pairwise not freely homotopic. My first claim is that with probability which tends to one when genus tends to infinity, this collection of curves would be just curves which go around handles and nothing, nothing, nothing more. And moreover, the number of handles which they encircle would be approximately log g over 2. And they would, the, the sort of small deviation from below and from above is admitted. And from the point of view of probability, you wouldn't see anything else. Which is already, <coughs> for me, was not intuitively obvious because you can have up to say decomposition into pairs of pants which is probably the most popular multi-curve on the surface contains 3g minus 3 curves you would never see that much of curves if you take a, multi a random multi-curve on the surface of light genes it's way too much log g for any reasonable genus it's log g it's, it's basically it's a constant which is not that that large so log, log G is very small in practical life. So if you work with surfaces of genus, 
say, around 10,000, then you see only multi-curves which have like five, six, seven, eight components, and that's it, and nothing else. So among all enormous variety, the number of different topological types of multi-curves grows exponentially when genus grows. You never see most of them. You see only these several ones. Moreover, the probability to see a multi-curve with exactly k components is converges in total variation to Poisson distribution with this particular parameter lambda. So this is the main, the main conditional theorem for genus which tends to infinity. Uh, this gamma is uh, Euler Macaroni uh, constant 0.57 Euler constant. Uh, you will see more or less why it appears. Now, one more thing. Uh, so did I tell? Yes, here I told everything. One more thing is the following. Now consider... Yeah, conditional means that we're using two conjectures which would appear in a second. Everything, all the results are conditional to two conjectures which would appear in a second. Uh, we assume that these conjectures are true and, and assuming that... Uh, let me consider conditional probability in the following sense. I considered just a second ago statistics for simple closed curves. So I assume that I'm wor already working with simple closed curve and I considered which part of them is separating and which part is non-separating. Assume that we have, we consider only multi-curves with at most k components. So I refuse to consider other ones. So I concentrate only on them. And I ask how often do you see weights different from one in these multi-curves? The answer is asymptotically never. So asymptotically, if you consider sort of conditional probabil probability like this, you can, you see only, you, in your experiment, you see, observe only weights one. Now, if you take off this condition and you consider all multi-curves, then the part of all multi-curves which have weight one is approximately 70% of all random multi-curves, so the exact proportion is square root over two, which is already somehow funny, this, Conditional probability is really completely different from the non-conditional one. Sir, yes. Mm, no, I think so. When I say that, Im, Im, how should I say? Well, here with bounded number k of primitive component, yes. Uh, when, yeah. Oh, uh, just a second. No, in this statement, I apologize. No, in this statement, I assume that all these weights that I, how should I say, that I'm considering, I take a multi-curve and I figure out what is the number k associated to it. And I consider the weights. Yes, it's non-zero. Yeah, apologies. Yes. Now, I said that the theorems are conditional, and they're conditional to the following two conjectures. First conjecture is conjecture on large genus asymptotics of so-called Mazur-Vich volume of the model A space of holomorphic quadratic differentials. And that's our conjecture. And actually, instead of this exact asymptotic relation, asymptotic upper bound would be sufficient to make our results unconditional in this part. And I, today, I can announce a conjecture about more general formula for volume of moduli space of meromorphic quadratic differentials. So we sort of guessed this formula about 10 years ago, but we never dared to announce it loudly because it was based on some very indirect way through computer experiments combined with formula for Mazur-Vich volume and so on. 
But in the meanwhile, there are several things which happened. In particular, we arrived to this formula and figure out this constant by completely different meanings, means which are more reliable. And also very recently, and I hope that this is next slide, so less than two weeks ago, yes? No, sorry. Uh, I had to put di here. It's not d, it's di. Yes. So i is this index which numbers the degrees of zeros. So I dare to show this conjectural formula by two reasons. So less than two weeks ago, they appeared a preprint on archive of Chen Muller and Sauvage uh, with a formula for major reach volume of this stratum in terms of these linear Hodge integrals. And several days ago, Maxim Kozarian, who looked at this formula, wrote a recursion, sort of a, a very simple recursion for these linear Hodge integrals uh, in the spirit of Verasoro constraints. You can program it, and you compute this quantity up to genus 100 and reasonable n in split seconds. So now I'm really, and, and this is exact formula, and it confirms our conjecture for this kind of strata. And now I'm really confident in our formula for this kind of strata and for the constant. And the main problem in the conjecture, yes, sorry. The main problem in the conjecture was this normalizing constant, which is very, well, which is sort of the most difficult thing to get. Now when I'm really confident, it should, it should be one and the same for all strata. Now, when I'm confident in it, with, you mean this thing? So that's exactly, so in recursion of Kazarian, he denotes g minus i by k, and he denotes this integral by c g k, and he wrote, well, so he has numbers c g k, and he wrote, I, I probably, I, Maxim is here, he can give a, a, a talk about it, it's beautiful. Uh, he wrote a recursion for this CGK in terms of CG minus 1 K, CGK minus 1, and CG1 K1, CJ2 K2, where G1 plus G2 is equal to G, K1 plus K2 is equal to K, and you recognize that it is sort of in the, in the spirit of, of Verasoro constraints right away. Yes, of course, but now it is at least a very efficient recursion which works instantly. And I'm not saying that this is a proof of the conjecture, but this is something way more concrete than we have to handle it. And I think that, well, there are professionals in the audience, I don't know, there, for, for some of them it might be, I'm not, I'm not expert in this kind of combinatorial problems, but even for me, somehow I see the way to approach it. And so I think that so, so somebody would do it definitely. So now I'm, I think that the question of, of at least this conjecture being proved, it's a question of time and energy, but it, it would be done. So now I'm, since recently, I'm really confident, since, since uh, recursions, recursion relations of, of Maxim Kazarian. Apparently, uh, Don Zagir and collaborators have something similar and working on it. Now, the second conjecture is sort of more ambitious. And this is the conjecture about asymptotics of this intersection number, large genus asymptotics of this intersection numbers. So, I ex we expect that for when genus is large and n is small with respect to g, small means grows at most logarithmically. Then uniformly for all partitions of the number 3g minus 3 plus n, so for any partition d1, etc., dn, you put the synthesis, and you can replace this intersection number by this combination of factorials with an error term, which is uniformly small for all partitions. Well, this might require some work, and here I don't know how much time would it take to prove this, but my first attempts to play with this conjecture already gave something and gave me some hope, 
So what we can prove is that, uh, unfortunately, not in the regime we're interested in, but in some regime, which is described here, all these intersection numbers satisfy this number as lower bound, as asymptotic lower bound. And also we have, in the particular case, when n is equal to 2, for two correlators, it is proved. So that's the two basic conjectures which we need. And modulo these conjectures, we can prove all our conditional theorems for large genus asymptotics. And now, so I told at the beginning that I somehow made this talk vice versa. I started with results and without any uh, background and so on. Now I'm ready to pass to the background and to, to, to tell more about how things are formalized. First, let me start with Mirzahani's count of simple closed geodesics. Uh, by the way, I like this picture because, well, because it's in Lumini, it's in the place which I like very much, because to my mind it's a beautiful picture of Mariam, and because this guy is Greg McShane. And er, sort of everything started with McShane's identity. If I understand correctly the story, Mariam participated at student seminar organized by her scientific advisor, Kurt McMullen, and he asked to prepare a talk about McShane's identity, and then Mariam in one week said that, well, you know, this identity might be generalized and one can do better, and in two weeks she get something else, and then like in several weeks she, she got just a whole collection of spectacular results. So, what is the relation between multicurves and geodesics? So here you see a picture of a multi-curve drawn on a uh, surface. So multi-curve for me, a collection of curves which do not have self-intersections and which are closed and which do not intersect between each other. And the first theory, the, first, the fact from hyperbolic geometry is the following. This is a purely, well, say, smooth picture. It's just smooth surface and smooth curves. Now you consider your favorite hyperbolic metric on this curve. And you imagine that your curves are sort of strings which try to contract in this hyperbolic metric and contracting they take shape of geodesics. And the claim is no matter what hyperbolic metric you choose, the corresponding, there exists a unique simple closed geodesic in any free homotopy class of every simple closed curve. And that if you start with a multi-curve, that is, if different components didn't intersect in bet between each other, then the resulting geodesics would not intersect neither. And this is true for any hyperbolic metric. Of course, the shape of geodesics would change depending on the metric. But the property that they would remain non-self-intersecting and non-intersecting would stay. The fact that they would be non-self-intersecting is sort of intuitively obvious because they are geodesics and if they have self-intersections it's not the shortest way to, to do things. The fact, that, well, the fact that they would not intersect between each other is not a complicated thing either. Uh, that they are? Okay, so if they are homotopic, if they are two homotopic loops, that's why I'm using this weight because then I just say that I am taking this curve with weight 2 or 3. This is the way of recording pairwise homotopic components. So I'm taking, in particular, I will take this multi-geodesics with weights also recording how many times do I have. Now, as soon as we have hyperbolic, so now we started with a multi-curve, with topological multi-curve like this. As soon as we introduced hyperbolic metric X, we can measure its length in this hyperbolic metric and associate the total length to a multi-curve. So if you have multi-curve gamma like this, the total length of this multi-curve is as sort of intuitive as it can be. You compute the length of each component and you take the linear combination of this length with weights which were here. Now, We'll say that two multicurves have the same topological type if, if and only if they belong to the same orbit of the mapping class group. If you can send one to another by a diffeomorphism and, and then by homotopy. So, for example, if you consider 
topological types of multicurves on surfaces of genus, on the surface of genus two, there are six of them. Uh, sorry, I'm speaking about primitive ones. Here, all the weights are equal to one. So I claim that if you have a multicurve on the surface of genus two, and this multicurve has only weights one, then it belongs to one of the six topological classes. Uh, and should I make a, so you can ask questions. So it, if it is somehow, sometimes one needs to convince people that this is true. And in, for example, so here, if there is only one component, then a, 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 cur a simple closed curve is, a, is either non-separating like here or separating and nothing else can happen. If it has two connected components, then either both of them are non-separating or one is separating and one is non-separating. And if you have decomposition into pairs of pants, so there are two different possible decompositions, nothing else. And, yeah? Yes, you, you may associate the graph with the Yes, the yes, the yes, yes, yes. And also it is the same as uh, you can imagine that your surface have hyperbolic metric or complex structure, whatever you prefer, and you can shrink these uh, curves, and then you get stable curves, and these stable curves represent all possible boundary classes of the lean effort compactification of M M2. Yes? In case you take the lowest uh, right picture, mm -hmm. if you erase the two curves of the sides, that's This one and this one. Yes. yes. Then you put just one. Yes. Which one of the two you have? So I suggest, so the question was, I erase these two ones, I keep this one. I'm supposed to get either this one or that one. Which of them do I get? I suggest to everybody, think a little bit, for, for 10 seconds, think about, think about it, and then I will give the answer. This is one of the ways, yes. Yeah. Yeah. One can do like this. It is, yes, it's this one. Yeah. It's not separating. It's not separating. Yes. Huh? Sorry? No, but it's sometimes it's not that obvious, but there, yeah. Okay. So now the theorem of Mirzahani, which I promised. She counts the number of, so she fixes hyperbolic metric X, and she counts the number of multicurves of this topological type. And topological type might contain weights for example, of length at most L. She proves that the resulting counting function is that the, the growth of the number of simple closed geodesics like this is not exponential as for all geodesics, but polynomial in L. The degree of polynomial is here. And one of the most beautiful parts of the theorem is the structure of the coefficient in this polynomial asymptotics. There is part of the coefficient, this one, which depends only on hyperbolic metric and does not know anything about gamma. There is part of the coefficient which knows everything about gamma, but which does not know anything about hyperbolic metric. And there is global normalizing constant, which depends only on genus and number of cusps. The implication of this theorem or the of this theorem is the following corollary. If you yeah. the counting, counting. does not depend on geometry. So I said frequencies do, do not depend on geometry. If you consider ratio of these counting things, like here, then for any two topological types. In the ratio, this thing disappears, this thing disappears, and only C of gamma survives. So, and C of gamma is something purely topological, for which Mirzahani gave an explicit formula in terms of psi classes. So, for example, so here's an example. Consider six punctured spheres. On a six punctured sphere, you, if you want to consider geodesics, you are not supposed to have a curve which bounds a disk because it would shrink to a point. You 
are not uh, supposed to consider a curve which goes around the cusp because it would escape to the cusp. So there are only two types of simple closed curves. And they differ by the number of cusps which they have on two sides. So either your simple closed curve cuts your sphere into three and three cusps or into two and four. And Mirzahani Mirzahani computed the ratio of frequencies and the ratio of frequencies is four thirds and she can do the same computation for any other uh, collection of simple closed curves. Now, now let me introduce one more object. Uh, I'm very much interested in guys which are on the right hand side, which are called square tiled surfaces. Uh, imagine that, so this is a flat surface with conical singularities, really tiled with squares. And the only extra thing which I have to which I have to add is that I uh, that I assume that this my squares are polarized. I know which side is horizontal, which vertical, and when I am gluing squares together, I glue vertical sides to vertical sides and horizontal to horizontal. They would appear in a second, uh, but here in this example, I just took two polygons. So I took a flat polygon drawn on a plate paper, on paper with square, squares, and then I took one and identified with the other, identifying the boundary. So this is a sphere, right? I, I, took, I take two disks and I identify them by a boundary. Topologically, it's a sphere. It is a flat sphere. It's square tiled. And don't think that there are any singularities of metric on the edges because I can just unfold them and you see that it's perfectly flat. And there are several conical type singularities. Now, let me associate to any multi-curve, like on the left, a family of many square tile surfaces, like on the right, in the following way. Uh, or rather, it would, it, it's sort of, it goes to two, two sides. It might be easier to go this way. So I have this square tile surface. It is decomposed into maximal flat cylinders with singularities on the boundary of each cylinder. For example, this is one cylinder. This would be another cylinder. One more and one more. And for each cylinder, I will take the waist curve. It would be a multi-curve. And I will associate a surface like on the left forgetting about all singularities about all, mm, with exceptions for those which the, where the angle is pi, I will associate cusps. So if you go to the left, is it visible how I construct surface on the left by a surface on the right? Uh, sorry, thank you for the question. Because the height of the cylinder, so this is the cylinder and it is tiled with two bands of squares and I want to keep track of the height of the cylinder. If you wish for every band of squares I put a waist curve and here I will have I have two bands of squares I have two homotopic curves so that's why I'm taking it with weight, with weight two. Same here I have cylinder of height two so that's why I have weight two here. And having a multi curves on the left, you can consider all possible square tile surfaces as on the right, corresponding to this picture. Now, uh, a theorem which we proved a year ago is that if you consider frequencies of square tile surfaces associated to a multi curve of the of given topological type then they are frequency, the frequencies of square tiled surfaces among all square tiled surfaces tiled with at most zillion squares 
are exactly the same, Wazil intends to infinity, are exactly the same as Mirzahani's frequencies of, of uh, hyperbolic multicurves. So basically, combinatorially, they're, they're sort of equivalent objects in terms of, of uh, frequencies. Now, let me say several words about major reach volumes. The moduli space of pairs, complex curve and holomorphic one form, uh, is modeled on the vector space, which is just the first, sorry, holomorphic one form with fixed degrees of zeros. I fix degrees m1, etc., mn of zeros of these holomorphic one forms, and I consider. Yes. Yes. Say. So yeah. I'm. I'm. Doing the following thing. In reality, you can choose either of two equivalent ways. Either you say that you work with the stratum of meromorphic quadratic differentials on genus G with n punctures, where n is the number of cusps on the left. Or you can consider all meromorphic quadratic differentials of genus G with n simple poles, and use the fact that the guys you mentioned is the principal stratum, the only stratum of top dimension. So the count for all the other strata would be negligible with respect to this one. This is, it's one and the same. Either you can say that it is for this fixed stratum, or you can say that for, you, you consider, so the, the other strata has non-trivial core dimensions. So the number of, oh, you, yeah, I see. Yeah, you can. Then we do not have this interpretation. And we are very much interested in frequencies of one cylinder, two cylinder, etc., square tile surfaces. And this would be my last slide. This is a big challenge because there is a, some, some funny thing which happens there. Uh, okay. I can, you know, probably I'm not sure that I would arrive to the last slide. Let me show the last slide. So let me jump to the last slide. So here's the answer to the question of, well, it's not the answer, it's illustration to the question of Andre. So I'm working with one particular stratum, it's genus three, and abelian differentials, or if you wish, metric, flat metric with trivial linear holonomy, and two conical singularities, four pi and eight pi. And you can compute square tile surfaces of this type, and that's their calculation how often you see, and you can, so for this particular stratum, you have square tile surfaces of genus, uh, sorry, with one, two, three, or four cylinders. You can have neither smaller, no more. And here it's a computation of how often do you see how frequent are one cylinder square tile surfaces, two cylinder square tile surfaces, three, and four. And you see these multiple zeta values here. And Unfortunately, this computation is done only for several low-dimensional strata. The guess is that for any stratum, the answers would be of the same style. And for me personally, it's completely enigmatic how these funny multiple zeta values altogether merge into rational number times pi power 2g this is the result of Andrei and Sasha Eskin of long ago. And the very presence of, of these uh, products of funny multiple zeta values in the geometric problem is something which is sort of unusual. I try to speak with people who are experts in this kind of things, and they, they hardly believe that this should, should be always like this. It's sort of something which is non common. And this, and this, here there is a conjecture that it would be always of this kind. I have no idea how to 
prove or disprove it, apparently Vincent de Lacroix has some evidence. Well, we know it for one cylinder. So it's just zeta of dimension times rational number. This is simple. Apparently, Vincent de Lacroix can prove it for two cylinders. That uh, would be sort of multi, multi zetas of like like here in numerator. And no idea how to prove, disprove, how to, to attack it in, in, in general case. But I should say that, again, probably answering to the, in, in a too detailed way to this question. So up to now, the formula for major which volume for whatever, the, the, well, there was initial formula of, of, of Andre and Sasha Eskin. They, they were later formulas. They give major which volume as just one block, as just one number. And I'm happy that in formulas like this, and in the formula which I was speaking, which would appear, uh, the volume is the sum of contributions of so square tile surfaces of fixed geometry. And you can study each individual contribution, and you can study sort of how often you see square tile surfaces of this geometry or of that geometry. So you, you have sort of much more information hidden th in this kind of formulas. And it is interesting to see uh, sort of statistics of geometry of, of ingredients. And now let me, oh, yeah, so this I showed. So. Strata like this are modeled on complex, on, on first cohomology of surfaces relative to marked points. This is, there is linear structure in this space. There is also integer lattice in this space, which provides a canonical normalization of the volume element. And so we have volume element defined on any stratum like this. And also we have a homogeneous, a positively positive valued function on the stratum, which is the area of corresponding flat surface, or in terms of periods, it's this quadratic expression and periods, which allows you to define sort of a unit ball in this, in the total, sp in, well, in, in this object. And the theorem of Major and Vich says that the total volume of any stratum understood in this way, when you sort of consider a unit ball is finite. It is not quite trivial. And this, yeah, and let me say one more word about integer points in these spaces. So what are, I, I said that we are normalizing volume using integer points in this space. They have geometric meaning because if you have holomorphic form such that all periods of this form are in the lattice integer plus i integer, you can consider the map from your surface to the corresponding elliptic curve. And you see that you have a ramified cover. So square tile surfaces are just ramified covers of, a, of the standard torus where all ramification points are located over one point. And one can give a similar definition of integer points in the strata of quadratic differentials using pillowcase covers and their variations of them. Now, then you can compute the volume, the major which volume, using, well, by computation of integer points. When you compute the volume of a ball over large radius, you can compute the number of integer points in this ball, 10 the radius, make the radius 10 to infinity, and then normalize, and you get the volume. So these volumes were calculated by uh, Eskin and Dokunikov and Eskin and Kunkov Panduripanta. They proved that the corresponding generating function is quasi modular form. And it allowed to compute many volumes. So Alex implemented this algorithm allowing to compute volumes for strata up to well, all strata in small genera. Then there was a computation. Well, then Chen Muller Zagi proved there. Uh, volume asymptotics for the principal stratum, then Amola Garwal proved by purely combinatorial methods uh, conjecture for large genus volume asymptotics for all strata. Yes. I started my talk 
with these words. I tried to make propaganda for Amol, saying that the guy is very bright, that they will be giving a mini course this summer. Great. For a so it uh, was it was a b it was uh, yeah sorry so I I was trying to somehow c condense my talk so I started the talk with a conjecture for asymptotics of volume of strata of quadratic differentials and this is a conjecture. There was a long-standing conje analogous conjecture for volume of all strata of abelian differentials. And there was a, well, last years, it's a history of, it was finally proved by several iterations, by different methods. And, and analogous conjecture for abelian differentials is just proved. Now there is a new one, which is sort of more, more, uh, nasty. So for abelian differentials, many things are done. For quadratic differentials, it's still, well, it's still work in progress. In particular, Laginus asymptotics, it's completely open. So we're, everybody is working on it. Uh, now, let me see. I definitely have to, let me skip definition of intersection numbers and psi classes because, because Maxim Kazarian was speaking about LSV formulas and this kind of things just a week ago. Let me say, just let me define something. So, well probably, psi classes are just first churn classes of the natural bundles when you have Model space MGN, you have n mark, well, curves with n mark points, and at each and at, cur at, at, at the point mark point number i, you can consider the cotangent bundle, and actually you get the natural tautological bundle. You can consider its first churn class, and then you can take polynomials in them and integrate with respect to MGN if some of these powers is equal to 3g minus 3 plus n. This is the dimension of this space. You get number. This is a rational number. Rational because mg is an orbifold. They're famous because of proof of Witten's conjecture and because they appear everywhere. And uh, when you have a whole bunch of numbers indexed by some multi coefficients, it's natural to organize them into a generating function. For me, it would be conven convenient to organize them into a generating function for each pair G and N separately. And this generating function would be a polynomial. So I introduce at this moment formal var variables B, which encode these powers. And this, the coefficients of this polynomial are exactly my intersection numbers up to some normalization. So I encode, I englobe all this intersection numbers in one polynomial and it actually it has geometric meaning so in one normalization it counts the number of integral uh, ribbon graphs of genus G with n boundary components of length B1 etc Bn this is interpretation of Konsevich and in interpretation of Mirzahani the corresponding polynomial up to slightly different scaling computes their analog of while Peterson volume of the moduli space of bordered hyperbolic surfaces of genus G with n boundary components of hyper hyperbolic length B1, etc., Bn. Now, I need a formal operation which transforms, well, an operator which transforms polynomials into numbers. Namely, on monomials, it works like this. I take the term number i of monomial, and when it is in the power mi, I associate to this monomial, well, to this brick of monomial, I associate factorial of the power times zeta evaluated in this power shifted by one. And I take the product. Now, let me make first a formal operation and then I will formulate the theorem. So, recall that we had 
six topological types of multicurves for surfaces of genus, of genus 2. So I will chop my surface by the corresponding multicurve. For example, here, or no, this is more interesting. So if I cut my surface of genus 2 by these two curves, here I get a surface of genus 1 with one boundary component. So I will associate the polynomial N11. And I forgot to say that I associate to, this, to each curve a formal variable. Say here, B1, here, B2. So here we have a curve of genus 1 with one boundary component with index B2. So I take polynomial N11, B2. On the left-hand side, if I cut by here and by here, I open up, I get sphere. So I get surface of genus 0 with three boundary components. One would have length B2. Two other would have length B1. So I take the products of these polynomials for each topological type of multicurve. I multiply by product of all letters, which are involved in the decomposition. And then I put a weight which is responsible for the <coughs> symmetry of the corresponding multicurve and for the number of components. In this way, I get a collection of polynomials. The true polynomials are written on the right. They can be written down because they are constructed using intersection numbers. And these intersection numbers are rational numbers which can be computed recursively, explicitly. And now I will transform all these polynomials into number by my operator. And then I sum up these numbers. And the claim is that what we get is the major reach volume of the corresponding structure. That this is what we'll get if we'll count square tile surfaces in this stratum. Well, so I'm right now, sorry, I'm speaking about quadratic differentials, and I'm speaking about quadratic differentials with only simple zeros and simple poles. Or if you wish, I'm speaking about the major reach volume of the cotangent space to MGN, where I take a unit ball from this cotangent space and compute its major reach volume. So this is the general formula, which basically tells what I told in genus 2. I don't know. So I would say it's the this, uh, unfortunately, this thing becomes more complicated very fast when genus grows. And now would have made accurate analysis of arithmetics of these answers. So we have like genus asymptotics, but it's not the same as arithmetic nature of these guys. No, I, I have no comment here. No, nobody studied it. OK, and now since I'm over, I have to, so this is just the, probably I will finish with our scheme, what, how we, how we, how we, stu how we proceed from this formula to what I said about all of our conditional theorems in light genus. So this sum is, already for genus 2 we had six uh, topological types of multicurves, for genus 3 there's something like 34, and this number just explodes. So you cannot compute the sum, this kind of sum, explicitly in large genus. It's sort of out of computational capacities of anything. So our approach to large genus is the following. First, we forget about all multicurves except the ones which are the simplest, the ones which just go around handles. And they're already much less, the G of them. Then we replace in the formula below the, this intersection numbers and psi classes by our asymptotic formula. So we reduce all computation to some sums of weighted sums of some products of factorials. And the sum is already much smaller, it's G, G terms. Now we reduce the resulting ingredients to multivariate harmonic sums, and we prove that the result 
gives these asymptotics, and this is rigorous. Now, by conjecture one, this is exactly the volume asymptotics, meaning that the other terms, other multicurves, do not contribute. If already, so we have a sum of positive terms, and if with sum of positive terms we already get the desired asymptotics, it means that the other terms do not contribute. They are sort of become negligible. So this is a schematic picture, and to finish there, so one of the things I'm sort of, so this is the answer to the to, to, to question of Igor, what is, what is other gamma, so gamma denoted multicurves, but also this, this Euler gamma. So it is well known that their harmonic sum has these asymptotics. It is a definition of, well, it's one of definitions of, yeah, there are many. Well, definitely, this is the, the most natural one, certainly. Now, we ran into harmonic sums in multivariate harmonic sums like this, and we had to write down asymptotic expansion, expansion for them. Well, this is sort of, in, in some sense, it was already known to people in combinatorics, but we had to do it uniformly because we had to estimate the error uniformly because what we needed for our computation was this weighted sum of these harmonic sums for different k's up to very large k. And to calculate these limits, we had some uniform estimates. And I should say that here, Amol was incredibly, in, incredibly efficient. So I was just amazed how he did it. And this I already showed. Thank you very much. And sorry for being slightly late. Thanks for your interest.